Thank you so much for joining us for Service Online today. I'm Kyle, I'm one of the pastors here, and I just wanna say welcome. Welcome to Meadow Park. Thank you for taking time out of your day to worship God and to celebrate everything He is doing in the world this Christmas season. You know, as we continue to prepare our hearts and minds and to really celebrate the true gift of Christmas, we're getting ready to kick off part three of our All I Really Want for Christmas series. And I'm gonna take a moment and invite you to come and experience Christmas at Meadow Park at one of our four candlelight Christmas Eve services. We're gonna have one at four 5 15 and 6 30 p.m. at our Bethel campus and we're also going to be celebrating at our Powell campus at 5 p.m. We hope you and your family would come and experience Christmas at Meadow Park. brightly shining it is the night of our dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul
I want to welcome you wherever you are joining us from, online, wherever you may be, or at our Powell campus. It's so great to be with you, or right here from our Bethel campus. We are in week three of our series, All I Really Want for Christmas. All I Really Want for Christmas. What do you want for Christmas? Maybe if you're a five or six-year-old, or whenever they lose their teeth, we know the song, right? All I want for Christmas is my, what, two front teeth. Or if you're Mariah Carey, um, all I want for Christmas is you. So we want things for Christmas. But what do you want for Christmas? In this series, we're talking about the things that we want for Christmas that can't be nicely packaged and put on or, under a tree. They can't be ordered uh, on a catalog, and, and they're not going to be delivered to our home. These are the things that, that we long for that are much deeper. Because we realize the older we get that the best things in life aren't things. We want God to bring a transformation for us, uh, to, to change us. We're looking at, at, at the, the wonderful things that money can't buy but that are available to every single one of us. These are the gifts that are the gifts of God for us, that we're reminded of at Christmas, the gifts of, of joy, the gifts of hope, the gift of peace, the gift of faith, the gift of love. These are the things that we long for in our world. And so Christmas reminds us of the time for us to really lean into that and to allow God to give us those gifts and to receive those gifts. Today, I want to talk about unshakable faith. All I really want for Christmas is an unshakable faith. Has your faith been shaken? Some of you might be saying, I don't even know if my faith's been shaken. I'm not even sure that I have faith. So this is an important message for you is to, to go, what, what does faith even look like? But where does faith come from? But for those that, that have a faith, that have put their hope and their trust in God, has your faith been shaken? Have you been rocked? Has it been tried? Has it been tested? Are, are you questioning Maybe God's faithfulness in your life. Are you wondering about where to continue in your relationship with God? Can you trust him? Can you move forward? Maybe you're dealing with job loss or cancer diagnosis or, or maybe, maybe you're going through divorce. You've been praying and, and as you're praying, the, the, the prayers don't seem to get answered. You've been praying for a long time and yet the pregnancy test is still negative. The adoption isn't going through. The mass isn't shrinking the addiction is still haunting you. You can't seem to break free. Or maybe your faith has been, been tested because of, of a past experience or what you're going through in, in church or with a pastor or with some Christian friends that, that have really let you down or that have hurt you. And you're not sure if, 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 if you believe and what you will do with your faith. Faith can be a very fragile thing. Faith is, is something that, that many of us maybe struggle with, and at times maybe you've wondered, thrown in the towel, or maybe you're at that point right now, or you have been in the past. There's many people right now that, that are giving up on church, that are giving up on faith, that are saying, you know what, um, I'm going to go my own way, I'm going to do my own thing. I don't need God, or at least I don't need the church. And, and what you often hear, and maybe you've said it yourself, uh, or a friend that you know, or a co-worker says, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I'm spiritual but not religious. It seems to be a, a quick way to answer something when you talk to somebody about coming to church with you or, or about having faith is, oh, don't worry, I'm spiritual, I'm just not religious, meaning I don't do the church thing. I, I'm spiritual. And I think what's, what's important in that is that I think there's a recognition in people that there is something more to life than just what is. My emotions, my feelings, the things around us, there is a spiritual reality, and I'm seeking that out, and I'm aware of that, but I just don't want the church or religion to define it for me or some book like the Bible. I want to do my own thing, I want to find my own path, and I want to do what feels right. And given the environment of our culture and society, it's not popular to be a follower of Jesus. And there's things that come against us and that push against us, that test our faith, that, that, that do you really believe that? Do you, do you hold on to those truths and, and you really go to church and here's all these other opportunities and things that you can do? And society has not made it easy for those seeking to live out their faith, at least their faith in Christ and their hope in Christ. And even vying for our attention and, and, and coming to church, we've seen that, that affiliation with re religion in this country is, is going off a precipice. The nons, those that claim they are part of no religion, is growing at an astronomical rate. Church attendance over the last five years has declined faster than it ever has before. And we understand that we have an important role to play. That God has entrusted the mission of the church to help people understand who they are in relation to God, to experience faith, to experience life in Him. And I see this, regardless of what people describe themselves as or saying, I'm spiritual but not religious, there's a hunger for something deeper, to know something. there's something more beyond what is in front of us right now. 
We need people of faith. We need people of unshakable faith. And I know we all get tested and tried, but I look at people around us, and there's those in our, in our church, there's people in my life that seem to have that unshakable faith. I think about my parents. I think about my, my in-laws. I think about my grandpa, who's long past, and, and just the faith that he had that was unshakable through world wars, through, through persecution, through losing everything, but this faith that he held on to until the last dying moment that, that actually only seemed to be getting stronger. How is it that some can have a stronger faith and that it seems like they are more at peace and more at ease and, and seem to have a, re, a deeper relationship with God? There's a confidence in their prayer. There's a hope in the way they live. This is an unshakable faith that we desire. Well, Christmas is the season where, where we are reminded again of faith. Where regardless of whether you're a Christian or a churchgoer or, or even when you live out in our society, the, the idea of faith and, and the, the, the magic of Christmas and, and the unknown is everywhere. And it's an opportunity for us to rekindle that faith and to deepen that faith and to hold on anew. When I think about even, again, outside of the church or outside the, Christ, uh, the Christmas story, this is the, that time of the, the magic of Christmas, the wonder of Christmas. I mean, really, if you think about it, whether or not you, you're a follower of Christ or, or believe in the actual Christmas story, society here as a whole, we, we believe and at least like to believe or tell the stories of, of flying reindeer, reindeer that, who have noses that glow, a big fat man with a white beard who, who lives in the coldest place on earth and on one night delivers presents to all the boys and girls in the world, driving, uh, you know, flying a sleigh the size of a Chevy Tahoe, and, and he squeezes through those chimneys, and we love that mystery and the wonder of, of, of that story. And we think about different things. We think about frosty snowmen who can talk. We think about elves who appear on shelves. We, we uh, think there's, there's polar expresses that, that take children to the North Pole. All of these wonderful stories, and we think about some of the movies like, uh, and, and classic plays like A Christmas Carol or It's a Wonderful Life, Ghosts of Christmas Past to the Future, and imagining what life would be like without the beauty and the spirit of Christmas. So I think there's an openness for all of us to say we want to see something more. There's something more that, that can be expressed in this life. And if you're going to be a, a follower of Jesus, and if you think about Christmas, the original story, the, the foundation that we have in, in the Bible, it is a story that requires faith. So much supernatural that happened that night when we think about a God stepping out of heaven, sending his son to be born as a baby to a virgin. And, in, and angels that are speaking to Mary and to Joseph and to shepherds on the fields, the heavens opening up and, and angel choirs that are singing. A mysterious star that appears and guides wise men from far lands to worship this newborn king. Something big is going down. Something big is happening. And that's the wonder and the awe and the mystery of Christmas. But it also requires faith for us to believe. But it also teaches us a faith that can endure. A faith that can be unshakable. And so today, I want to look at a couple of characters that we read about right in and around the Christmas story that demonstrated incredible faith, an unshakable faith, and a faith that I believe can inspire us today to challenge us to maybe take a step into faith, to renew our faith, and to just put our hope in God. We're going to look at, uh, like I said, four characters in the story. Two of them are young, and two of them are very old. And we're going to see how faith played out in different ways in their lives. The first two we're going to look at are very familiar and well-known to us. They are Mary and Joseph, two young people beginning their, it early in their lives. Mary, is, uh, as historical research has, has uh, led us to believe and know that she was probably in her teenage years. She was a young girl. Joseph, probably some years, uh, maybe a few years older as, a, as what would be a man in that, in that age. And they were engaged to be married. They're living in Nazareth, and, and they're imagining life together, and what could be, I'm sure Mary is just excited. She found this wonderful man named Joseph who wants to be her husband, and they've gotten engaged, and man, he's a carpenter, and, and uh, he works with his hands. He's a faithful guy. I mean, at least their house is going to be nicely furnished. She's picturing kids running around and what life is going to be like, just li living in, in the obscure village of Nazareth and just being a simple village girl, raising, raising her kids and living life with Joseph. And so when we pick up her story, we see that, that, that it was such a, a change for her and, and how much faith was required. Let's look at uh, Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Elizabeth's her cousin, and in her old age, uh, 
she was uh, expecting a child that God had, had uh, prepared them for and said, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. So just step back for a moment. Here's Mary just going about her life, going about her day in this little village of Nazareth. And here comes an angel and begins to say, greetings, favored woman. And she must be going, what in the world is happening? This is an unusual encounter, a spiritual encounter. And I wonder sometimes in our own lives when we feel God moving, maybe it's something in our gut, something in our spirit, maybe the, the hairs on our, uh, on our, on our you know, arms stand up or on the back of our necks and we're in worship or we're, we're reading scripture or we're just seeing God in some way and, and it catches us off guard. And we realize there's something spiritual that's happening and I love the way scripture describes it in verse 29. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. <laughs> confused and disturbed. What's going on here? We're being exposed to a new reality. Something else is happening that breaks the norm of what we're thinking and what we're experiencing. And Mary is experiencing that. She's confused and disturbed. But the angel says to her, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary's mind had to be spinning at this moment. What what are you talking about? I'm a simple village girl getting ready to marry Joseph. What do you mean I'm going to have a son, and you're already giving me the name for him? The Lord saves. What are you saying? The son of the most high God, and and he's going to reign and rule in his kingdom. I'm raising a king. What's going on? And there's even a slight problem with this, uh, Gabriel, because as she says in the next verse, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren. But she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for the word of God will never fail. Some translations say, for nothing is impossible with God. When God sets a plan, when God gives a vision, when God speaks faith and hope into the future, that will come to pass. It will not fail. And so this amazing story is told to Mary, and what does she do in this moment? Does she believe? Does she accept it? Does she step forward, or does she say, this is crazy? There's no way, I'm not interested, I'm doing my thing, no thank you, God. How does she respond? We see this amazing courage in the step of faith when it says, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. We see faith in Mary as this this young woman, this young girl who who has a whole different future now placed in front of her, an incredible responsibility that's spoken onto her. And here's her response, I am the Lord's servant. May it come to pass. Mary listened to God. She listened to his voice. She listened to what the angel said. She processed it, but she believed it. But not only did she believe it, she stepped into it. She embraced it, and she said, I'm going to walk in that direction. May it be so. What an amazing faith to begin. Meanwhile, we're looking at Joseph. And Joseph, same thing. He's found this wonderful girl. He's going to marry her, and and he's engaged to her, and they're starting to plan what their life is going to be like and their home and their future. And, And here now he finds out that Mary is pregnant. He knows it's not his child, and this has never happened before, and, and Mary's probably trying to explain to him, look, look, Joseph, an angel appeared and said the Holy Spirit, is, I'm going to conceive a child, and this was all probably way too much for him to take in. And even knowing that he was a faithful man, as Joseph considered what was the best plan and, and how he could not disgrace her and, and do the honorable thing, we read in Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, it says, as he, as Joseph considered this, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then there was a prophecy that that was shared about, about this being the fulfillment of that prophecy. And I can imagine, again, Joseph thinking, this is hard to believe. 
I mean, this is, this is not the path that I imagined. And, and, and he, like so many, have been living for, for hundreds of years with the expectation that someday the Messiah will come. Someday God will send the one who will save them. And for him to now say, this is going to be my son. This is the one I'm going to raise. That, well, how does he respond to these, this, this amazing challenge? When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. He did as the Lord commanded. How do you process and take in when you feel God speaking to you, when God is stirring in you, when God is giving you a vision, when God is asking you to do something, when you are open up and understand the reality of who he is, how do you respond? We see in Mary and Joseph at the beginning of their journey, this was going to change their lives, but they stepped into that promise. They stepped into the hope. They stepped into this in faith saying, okay, Lord, I will do as you command. And they were faithful. And Joseph took those steps and he took Mary to be his wife and he named the baby Jesus and he, he raised him. We don't know all of the rest of Joseph's story, but we know Mary's. Mary raised Jesus, and, and even as she saw him as a young man, and as he began his ministry, and she saw the, the crowds that, that, that followed him, and then the people that abandoned him, she saw the highs and the lows, she saw him hanging on the cross, brutally executed by capital punishment, and she wept, and she mourned as a mom does, and she celebrated at the resurrection, and she became one who proclaimed him as the Messiah. I mean, what an amazing journey if we could just look at her whole life and say, what an unshakable faith. And it began in this moment of obedience, of trusting God with her future, and trusting that God was faithful to do what he said he would do. How does faith like that begin? How does faith emerge in us? There's some great chapters in, in, in Hebrews, Hebrews chapters 11 and 12, that really help us understand faith and what it means to follow God and to have a, a faith that endures. Hebrews 11, chapter 1 says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. That's a statement that's hard to imagine. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. In other words, through faith, the unseen becomes evident. Through faith, the unseen becomes evident. Maybe some of you have been, been watching people who are following Jesus from a distance You've been around them, and you're going, how do they worship God, and, and how do they believe in, in Scripture, and how do they pray, and, and why does it feel so real for them? Because when you put your faith in God, your spiritual eyes are open, and all of a sudden, what is unseen becomes evident, and it becomes as real as day. Another way to say it is, faith is the evidence. It's not the result of evidence. It's really what becomes the evidence when you see people living out in faith and, and, and confidently, assuredly walking towards what they believe. It's not as though we're uncertain or unsure. There is a faith there that walks and that moves. So how do you begin that faith? How do you embrace like Mary and Joseph? Well, unshakable faith begins a simple faith. See, it begins a simple faith. Eventually, simple faith gets shaken and it gets tested and gets tried, but, but unshakable faith just begins a simple faith. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 6. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Faith. It's that step. You must believe that God exists. It's the doorway. It's the step that opens us up to a whole new spiritual reality. We step into faith. We step into what God has for us. And there our eyes are opened and faith takes root and, and, and allows us to follow a new path in life, a path that God has for us. And Mary and Joseph did that, and it began their journey. It changed their life like they could never have imagined. And God wants to do that in your lives. If you're young, what is God speaking into you? What, what vision is he giving you? Where is he directing you? If you're older and, and, and maybe you, know, you ask God, give me a new vision, give me a new dream to pursue. God, what is he asking you in faith to pursue? But now it said we're going to look at two younger folks, Mary and Joseph. Who are the two older folks? Now these are two old people that, that don't have little figurines that are carved out and placed around the nativity set. And yet we find them in Luke chapter 2 when we hear the story of Jesus' birth. They weren't there at the manger. They weren't, um, they, they, they weren't at the side of the, in the stable. But early on when, when Mary and Joseph followed the traditions... And the customs of the Jewish law, which was to, to circumcise their firstborn son, their, their son, the baby, Jesus, they took him, and then they took him to the temple, and they had him dedicated. It's at the temple that we encounter these two old people. 
And Scripture tells us that they were old. And the first is this. It's Simeon. Now, Simeon was, was an old man. We don't know exactly how old, but he had had a, a, a promise from God. The Holy Spirit had, had, had told him that he would not die until he saw the Messiah, until he witnessed it, until he knew. And so he had hold, held on to this hope. And imagine, again, the kind of faith that that takes in your old age. It's been hundreds of years for this promise. And, and generations and generations have not seen the Messiah and had just continued to hope for his coming. But some... but but. The Holy Spirit told Simeon he would see it. And so he was holding on to that. And, and one day, the, the Spirit led him to the temple, Scripture says. And so he goes to the temple. He's, he's just in tune with God's Spirit. And God's Spirit leads him to the temple. And so he goes. He doesn't know yet what to expect. But when he comes into the temple, what does he see? There are Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And here's what, 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 what Simeon does. He takes the baby. And he recognizes in that moment that this is the promised child. This is the one. We read in Luke chapter 2, verses 29 and to 32, Sovereign Lord, Simeon said, as he's holding the baby, Now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. He's just celebrating this moment. I have seen your salvation, and he declares the prophecy of this child that has been held for so long. And he's going to be a light to all the nations it's going to be the glory of Israel, but not just for Israel, but for all people. He declares it's a new day, a new hope, and, and, and he receives this promise that he's been waiting for for so long, has been faithful to, to not waver from. And as he's holding the baby and as he's meeting Mary and Joseph and saying these things, there's an old woman that's in the temple. Her name is Anna, and Anna is, is a prophet. She's one who, who hears the word of God. She, she speaks on behalf of God, and, and we don't know much else about her, but it says that, that when she was married just seven years, her husband died, and she's lived as a widow ever since. She's 84 years old, and she spends her time in the temple, and, she's, and here's what we read about her in Luke chapter 2, verse 37, 38. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. And as she heard what he was saying, right, as she's hearing these promises, and, what, and, and I'm sure Simeon and Anna probably knew each other, or, or at least he knew of her, and, and she's hearing that this is the promised Messiah, and she just, it says she began praising God. But then she believed as well in, in, this, in, in this promise that she said she talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. I love this contrast. Here are these two older saints. They have been faithful for years, waiting for the promise, praying and hoping and seeing, and when it comes, how they embrace it and how they celebrate and how they rejoice. An unshakable faith that endures. How do we experience an unshakable faith that has a time and that, that will overcome the difficulties and the challenges and that will endure? There's a couple things I learned from these stories. The first is this, hold on to the promise of God. Hold on to the promise of God. Mary and Joseph, they needed to hold on to that from the, when they first revealed it and saw it. And they walked towards that promise, and they had to continue to hold on to that promise through all the highs and lows of Jesus' life and of their lives. And Anna and Simeon, they held on to the promise. They were faithful, Simeon, that he would see that what, what was promised. And Anna, not, maybe not knowing what it was that she was praying for and what the Messiah would, if she would ever see him, but she prayed and fasted and she held on to the promise. She committed her life. Hold on to the promise. You see, what happens is we look at the problems around us and our faith becomes shaking. We need to live towards the promise before us, not the problems around us. Live towards the promise before you, not the problems around you. This is unshakable faith. What are you looking at? What are you seeing we have to look beyond what is and know that God is true to what he said. He is who he said he is. He will do what he promised for us. He will never leave us. Your faith can hold on to that. And an unshakable faith that endures too, it never gives up. I know this is easier said than done, but it just never gives up. Because once we give up, it's not an endurable, unshakable faith, right? It never gives up. In Hebrews chapter 12, we were looking at Hebrews chapter 11, now back chapter 12, it says this, 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses to the life of faith, right, all those that have gone before, that have been faithful, that have endured, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. You see, what knocks us out of our faith, what, what, what shakes us is the sin in our lives. It's the, it's the pieces that trip us up where we stop following God because we take our eyes off him and we start looking at the problems around us and our own selfishness. Strip that off. And then it says this, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. The Bible doesn't hide this from us. It's an endurance race. It's, it's going to test us. It's going to try us. We, there's a race marked in front of us, and it's going to need that endurance never to give up. And it continues. We do this. How do we run with endurance? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who, get this, right? He initiates and perfects our faith. Who initiates our faith? It's God coming towards us. It's Jesus who comes towards us. We look at him, and we say, God, begin that faith in us. As you're thinking about following Jesus or you're wondering where faith comes from, it begins with him. He initiates it in us. But the beautiful thing is he also perfects it in us. He grows in us. We need to continue to stay focused on him and never to give up, to continue at it. And another point that we see from these stories, an unshakable faith that endures, it celebrates the next generation. See, for faith to endure, it can't just be good for us and for one generation. It needs to celebrate the next generation. It needs to celebrate the new. It needs to be ready to pass the baton on. When I think about what Simeon did in Luke chapter 2, verse 34, it says, Then Simeon blessed them. He took Mary and Joseph, and here's this young couple with a baby. And here are Simeon and Anna, this, this, this old and, these older and devout saints that, that come around, and they bless Mary and Joseph and this child. And they celebrate what God is doing. God is doing something new. He's taken the old covenant, the rules and religion of temple and, and, and law and Torah, that, that, was, that was the history of the people. And now a new day had dawned. And who were the first two that embraced this fully, that marked the transition from the old to the new? As John Piper says it, it was the, that, that Luke specifically chose these two individuals to represent that they are now the most receptive to the new era. They are the ones that are rejoicing that the new has come. And if we are to pass on generation and have a faith that endures not only in our lifetime but through next generations, we need to continue to celebrate what God is doing in the next generation. Let me just speak for a moment to those in, in the older generations, those that, that have experienced life and faith and that have been here and, and in our church and, and serving God faithfully. We need you to celebrate the next generation. We need you to celebrate that God is doing something new. We need you to come around and to embrace and to bless and to pray for like Anna, to pray and to fast, to do for us what maybe the next generation is learning to do, to be faithful in your giving and your commitment and to say, I want to pass it on and I bless what God is doing. When I see young people taking steps of faith, I celebrate that. When I see that, that they are pursuing God and teaching the gospel and, and sharing that with others, I celebrate it and I want to bless it and I want to do whatever I can to further that. We need you to champion the next generation. It gives us the faith that endures. When we can see you celebrating and saying, it's not the way that I would do it, it's not the way that I experienced it when I was younger, but God bless you because you are experiencing God in beautiful ways and we just want to champion you and celebrate you. That is a way that a faith endures. That is a way when a younger generation looks at the older generations and says, I want to be like that. I want to live like that. And it's the way the faith endures from generation to generation. And for the younger generations or maybe even older generations that, are, that have not discovered faith in God, if you are new to faith or, or wanting to take that step, listen to what God is saying to you. What is the Spirit speaking to you? Pursue that. Let him give you that vision and that faith so that you can step into that. We need the next generation of young men and women to step into faith to say, I am following God. I'm dedicated to him in my school, in my work, at my college. I will not be shaken because I know God is true and God is real and his hope and his love has endured through the generations. And you walk with a faith while others can't see, you see as clearly as your spiritual eyes see that God is with you that he has a plan for you, that he has the best in mind for you. An unshakable faith, we need that in our generation. We need to be young and old and everywhere in between, walking together with an unshakable faith. But I know it can get tough. 
I know we have moments where we want to throw in the towel. Or we're not sure. Or again, we've been praying and asking God and just maybe not getting the answers that we long for or need or desire. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Look at, look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. Shan and I have written these out in places that we can see over, over different seasons in our lives as a reminder to endure, to not give up. It says this, so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. It's such a powerful verse because when we're tired and when our knees are weak, Maybe we want to give up. But here the writer in Hebrews is just saying, don't do it. Take a new grip with your tired hands. Straighten your legs. Because what we need is we need to be strong for the next generation. We need to be strong for others around us. And together when we do that, there's a a new hope that emerges. This is a faith that endures. The Christmas story just reminds us again that, that, that there is a new beginning. That God continues to do new things. And that, that he is faithful from the youngest generation to the oldest generation. And that when we believe the miracle of Christmas, the beauty of what God has birthed, that there's a spiritual reality, a new life that we can experience, why not embrace it? Let Christmas rekindle that spark of faith. God wants to do something new in your life. God wants to walk with you through the challenges and through the difficulties. Let him in and watch your eyes be open to a life of faith. Let's experience that magic of Christmas, the awe, the wonder of a God stepping out of heaven and into our world to give us life, life now and life for all eternity. We trust God. We believe in his word. Would you commit yourself to him anew today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's astounding when we read the story of Christmas. We read the story of your birth and we think about Mary and Joseph and just how they trusted how they just believed what you had said and the promises that you gave and they walked in faithfulness to to that end. Father, may you birth new faith in the next generations. Father, may we be a church and a people that leads others to you to discover what it means to have faith in you, to live life anew. Awaken that spirit in us, God. You are the initiator of our faith, as your word says. So Father, we pray that you would initiate that today and if Anyone who's listening right now, God, would surrender their lives to you and say, God, I just surrender my life. Here's my heart. I trust you. I believe in you, God. Open my eyes to see a new reality, a spiritual reality. Forgive my sins. Set me on a new path. Father, here's my life. I give it to you. Father, open that path of faith in their hearts. And Father, for those that have been serving you and following you who may be going through moments of testing and trials and are tired or worn out or just uncertain or doubting at this time, Father, would you renew their faith? Would we just be reminded of the faith of of Anna and Simeon that just endured, that prayed and fasted and never gave up until they saw your promise? Father, the next generation needs us to be and to live faith in that way. Give us the courage to take a new grip with our tired hands, to straighten our shaky legs, God, and to stand strong in the faith for you, for ourselves, God, for the next generation. We love you, and we thank you for this amazing gift of faith that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you again for joining us for service online. We hope that you were encouraged today as you worshiped alongside others online. Hey, we would love to get to know you. Take a moment and uh, find some more information online at meadowpark.org or drop us a note on any of our social media channels. But we would love to get to know you personally. We have three services that you can come and experience each and every Sunday. We've got a 9 and a 10.30 a.m. at our Bethel campus and a 10.45 a.m. at our PAL campus. We hope that you have a great week.